Well, I invite you to stand if you are comfortable doing so and join together in our gathering prayer. Gracious God, we give thanks that we have called us to be your people. In our times of gloom, you have sent us light. When we are weary and discouraged, you lift us up. In our thirst for meaning and purpose, you bring us to living water in Jesus Christ. Set before us now the joy of discovery and a vision of future possibilities. Unite us in friendship with one another, with Christ as our center and inspiration. Amen. Peace of God be always with you. I invite you to uh, greet those around you with a sign of peace and make a special effort to find somebody you don't know and extend a sign of peace.
seated. Well, welcome here to worship at First Plymouth Congregational Church of the United Church of Christ. Uh, welcome to those who have gathered here and those who are joining us on our webcast. No matter if you've been a part of a church for many decades or just checking out what the Christian faith is about, or if you've had a not best experience with churches in the past, you are welcome here. Even I am welcome here. In case you don't know me yet, I'm Bob Von Trieber. I'm the new bridge minister who will be with you until your new sen senior minister, Jenny Schultz Thomas, uh, whom you called last week, comes to join you here hopefully in July. And Reverend Amy Rowland is welcome here. Amy has been consulting with this church during its time of transition, and she will be preaching, bringing us a good word today. I invite you to read the announcements in the bulletin, especially information about upcoming events and opportunities that are on pages 9 through 12 in your bulletin. A few things to lift up. Next Sunday, Palm Sunday, I'm planning to do some things in worship that are hopefully are kid-friendly, so if you've got youngsters, hope you will bring them. We're going to have our children's choirs singing next Sunday as well. So I hope families with children will be here for that occasion. And note that as we get close to Easter, you can order Easter flowers uh, at Mission Central, I think later today. There's information in the bulletin. Also, uh, on Good Friday, April 19th, we're going to have a special worship service here at 7 o'clock in the evening with our friends from the Calvary Presbyterian Church and a special cantata performed by our combined choirs accompanied by a chamber orchestra. Don't miss that.
The scripture lesson for this morning is from the prophet Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, verses 16 through 21. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down. They cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. The word of God for the people of God. When I was a young girl, I used to wake up in the morning and I'd go right to the window and look out. First thing I had to see, is everything the same as it was yesterday? Now I'd say my sense of curiosity was informed by a number of things, one of which I'm quite sure was having read the book, Willie's Silly Glasses. And in this book, Willie put on glasses that made the world look upside down. So trees had their roots in the air, that sort of thing. And I'll say I had also been a regular attender of Sunday school. So I knew about things like sudden floods, rainbows, miracles, resurrection. So I think at the time I would have said I had an informed curiosity about what could be happening today. So to the window I went. So 
I suppose it's not surprising that professionally I chose um, to work with transition and work with change, because I'm curious about change. I find it exciting and inviting. And over the last few months, I've had the opportunity to work with your transitions team and to have a forum here and work with all of you in your ministerial uh, transition. So I have to say I'm particularly delighted to be here this morning and say congratulations and continue the celebration of this new call of uh, Reverend Jenny Schultz Thomas uh, and your new ministry together. Congratulations. So a new ministry, it opens up so much hope and promise, it's exhilarating. But part of my work as a transitions consultant is to help congregations uh, recognize and step into the fullness of the changes that occur during a ministerial transition. And in the course of my work with congregations, I've learned very clearly that not everyone is quite as curious and interested in change as I am. Some of us are quite averse to it, and for good reason. If you've read uh, A Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt, you get some insight into our natural disposition to, to change is in part hardwired. It's part of who we are. So some of us accept change very easily. Others of us are more protective and, and for good reason. It's part of our hard wiring. So this difference that can feel like conflict sometimes is actually just a very different perspective or way of engaging the world. So learning to tell stories about who we are is a really significant part of transitions ministry. We'll learn, we learn to tell stories that say yes and. Yes, I experienced it this way, and you experienced it that way. So regardless of our dispositions toward change, one thing that supports us in our common work is having a shared context for what's going on. Rituals can serve that, pro that, that purpose. Even the, the liturgical calendar helps us. It gives us insight and guides us through the seasons of our lives. And then part of the reason for th these contexts are so helpful is that we have these storytelling brains. Left to their own devices, our brains will just tell us a story about what's going on. So th but the good news is we, we do get to have input. We can give some guidance to these stories. And in this way, um, having frameworks can help us provide a story or a shared context. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, that question of, is this glass half full or half empty, right? We get to give context to the same experience, half full, half empty, what is that context? And sometimes deciding on that context can tell us about how we're feeling about that context too. So when it comes to transitions in this culture, we tend to have a sort of abbreviated approach to them. For instance, aging is probably one of the most significant and lifelong events that we participate in uh, while we're on this planet. Profound transformations occur, and we recognize them over dinner once a year at a birthday party. Right? So, so we're not really a, a culture that looks at what these arcs are of transition that we may be in and what the both the subtle and profound changes that might be happening in our lives get very condensed into sound bites. So then when we find ourselves in an arc of a transition, we can feel a little, a little rudderless. And that's completely natural when we don't have a context, we don't have a rudder, something to put in the water that will steady us and allow us to steer a little bit while we're going through the transition. So narrative frameworks can help us provide a rudder, a little bit of uh, stability as we're going through a change. And when it comes to transitions, uh, William Bridges has provided a really nice sort of narrative arc for understanding the, the phases that we go through in a transition. So he describes uh, three simple phases. Uh, the first is endings. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Something, something that has been happening is coming to an end. And then the second phase that he identifies 
is, is a little more unusual. He calls it the neutral zone. And the third phase is the new beginning. What thing is it that you're going to identify is the next thing? So just understanding that we're part of a natural transition can just help, help us be more present, more steady, and more kind of interested in what's going on so we can navigate a little better. And it's not that each one of these phases is distinct and there's no overlap. We can find ourselves kind of meandering through the different phases um, in, over, in overlapping ways. And we don't all go through the phases at the same rate. Still, it can be helpful to use the framework as a context for common language or what might be going on. So in this congregation, phase one, the endings, some of you may have really felt the impact when George let you know he was going to be leaving. But, but some of you may have had more delayed responses, and the, the sense of goodbye for some of you may have started immediately. Oh my gosh, I'm, I need to start saying goodbye to George. For others of you, it may have started last month, when you suddenly, his absence created a new sense of emotional uh, response. There's no set timing for experiencing any of these responses and no set of emotions that everyone shares. Still, it's helpful to know that there is this initial phase where we acknowledge that what has been happening is coming to an end. Our relationship with our old minister is ending as we've known it. So we might have different timing and different impacts the way our emotions play out. But early on, for instance, we might feel a disappointment that our future won't be the way we expected it. And as departure comes near, we might also feel something like grief. And over time, we might come to feel appreciation for what the relationship gave us. No one of these experiences is right or wrong. It's just all part of what's going on. The minister is leaving, and we're all dealing with it. Now, at phase two, Bridges offers us some really useful insight with his description of this neutral phase, of this uh, middle phase, what he calls the neutral zone. Because instead of saying what we often hear today, that every ending is a new beginning, he, he fills out that, that middle section and says, you know, there's stuff that happens in the middle, between the ending and the new beginning. There's a letting go. And there's all of this emotional processing that is attached to the ending happening and the new beginning maybe not quite happening. So this in-between period can bring up feelings of emptiness because we maybe haven't let go of the past. Or we've let go of the past, but we haven't yet grasped the new beginning. And it, it's so infrequent that we name this time when we allow the old to fall away. But it's really, it's not unlike when we leave a, a field that's been very productive and we leave it fallow instead of planting a new crop immediately. And it's also not unlike the season that we're in right now of Lent. We find ourselves in a period of letting go. You know, Lent's a time when many Christians will give up something intentionally, and this harkens back to early Christianity when Lent was seen as a time of purification and preparation. But that letting go, that feeling of emptiness, can make it especially important that we're able to cultivate compassion and, and an attentive awareness to what's happening so that we don't just feel and that we are stuck in this emptiness. And again, uh, here's another kind of framework, is what neurobiology tells us that when we encounter perhaps an uncomfortable response, or an uncomfortable feeling, we have, our brains have a negativity bias. So we are really ready to tell any story in the most dangerous way possible so that we keep ourselves safe. And that's just part of our also part of our brain wiring, that 
goes way back to when, well, we were less safe. There was a chance we might get eaten before lunchtime. And so it was important that our brains did that for us. But now we have this, uh, we have a much safer environment that we live in, and we have this opportunity to take a second thought. So our first response may be, yikes, but we can take a breath and act on that second thought, which is, well, I'm a little uncomfortable, but that's to be expected. So we can tell the story that sort of normalizes that experience of being a little uncomfortable. So just being aware that that, that negativity bias is active in us can also help us kind of keep that rudder in the water and stay present with the uncomfortable feelings, knowing that part of it is our brain is still trying to take care of our body. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So by naming and attending to this season of preparation, including what risk might feel like, it becomes easier to recognize both the phase of transition that we're in and also hold this sense of anticipation. Phase two involves letting go, but it's a preparatory letting go. So we feel not just a loss, but also the anticipation of what's to come. Part of what we are doing is we're making room for a new thing. And this new thing, right here we are, not only a, a congregation with a new minister about to arrive, but here we are in Lent. And for anyone who's been through it before, not to spoil it for newcomers, but the new thing that's coming in a week or two is pretty splendid, right? We remind ourselves of it each year. It's that important. This cycle of something ending, being somewhat lost, and being re resurrected. It's part of our story of how we remind ourselves that these are natural seasons in our lives and being able to recognize what it is that helps us stay present focused, attuned, and bring ourselves together and hold ourselves together in community. So phase three, this new thing, it's not always a literal resurrection, but it's a new beginning, as you will have when Reverend Jenny arrives this summer. And this new beginning is often so full of excitement, it can take a while to settle into what will become normal for you. But it can also be a time of apprehension and anxiety because so much is still unknown. So as I mentioned earlier, these phases can all overlap. And here at First Plymouth, there are many ways in which you're going through all three phases at once. Saying goodbye to George, letting go of old expectations, building excitement, they're all happening now. So when we don't have, when we don't have an overarching narrative, that helps us see that these different stages are playing out. It's easy to feel that something must be wrong. How could, how could we possibly be happy and sad and excited and anxious at the same time? Well, we can and we do. We feel many things at once because many things are happening at once. So part of my role here with all of you is to talk about that practice of saying yes and. Yes, goodbyes are still happening. And yes, letting go is happening. And yes, the new beginnings are happening. And yes, to the questions and apprehension. And yes, there's lots of excitement and anticipation. All of these, experience are, all of these experiences are part of moving through transition and moving forward. And while it can be helpful to have this framework or understanding that this arc or full season of a transition, it's also helpful to reflect on the skills that each of us can bring to this time. It's probably one of the most common questions I, I get from a congregation where you are is, how can we best navigate this change? And there are some common skills that simply would be helpful. Good communication skills, building relationships with each other, growing in trust and compassion are all skills that will strengthen your ministry. And it's also true that some amount of surrender will be important. And here's what I mean by that. 
Let's say an example that I'll give is when you go skiing. When you know you're going to go skiing, you can exercise and build up your strength, your stamina, your endurance. You can make sure you have appropriate equipment, clothes that are suitable to the weather. All of these things are usually within our control to prepare. So we get up there and we are prepared. And then we're on top of the mountain looking down. And it turns out we have to bring not just all of our skill and preparation, but a certain amount of surrender to that mountain. There is no bending the mountain to our will. Right? We're going to go down that mountain and discover what is beneath us, pushing us, holding us, guiding us, and we are going to bring all that we are and surrender to what is there and find ourselves in how we navigate that mountain. It's exhilarating. It's very, very much a story of being in the present moment. So our skill and our trust and our abandon carry us down the mountain. And it's not that different in congregational life, or actually in, in life in general, right? We build the skills we can, and then we just live by faith, a faith that is beyond, beyond our control. So having your very able transition team working these last two years and participating as an entire congregation in the process, you've done all you can do to prepare in advance. Calling your new minister, you're now at the top of the mountain. You will serve that ministry with all of your preparation and with your trust. Trust in your new minister, trust in each other. And in life, as with on the mountain, your skills and your trust will guide you. What we don't often talk about in transitions work is that what happens transition by transition is that we become transformed. Our work in the church and our work as people of faith is always the work of transformation. Our work is not just to the task at hand, but our work is to be the hands of faith and face of God in the world. In the transition from one ministry to the next, it can be easy to get swept up in the speed of changes and the many different emotions and the simple fact of learning of how to be in a new relationship. But all of this transition work is so we can all be the people we mean to be, and we can do the work we're here to do as people of faith, and as your mission statement so beautifully says, to witness to God's love in word and deed. And may it be so. Amen.
One of the things I um, heard from your new senior minister who will be coming in a few months is, um, is that she appreciates and likes to incorporate into worship times of silence. Now, if you had a chance to meet her and listen to her and hear her talk and experience her energy, that might come as a little bit of a surprise. But, uh, but I'm going to, maybe in these next few weeks, give you a little chance to start getting accustomed to that a little bit. And so as we enter into our time of pastoral prayer, I invite you to start just by closing your eyes taking a few deep breaths and experiencing the presence of the Spirit in this place and perhaps to lift up any unspoken prayers. So let us pray. Holy God, who has guided this faith community in the past, we give you thanks and praise for this church's history, all the things that it has done together in ministry and in service. And in this time of transition, we pray that you will comfort and assure those who mourn the ending of one chapter in its history. Help us be open to fresh moving of the Spirit. May we not be content to rest on our laurels and refuse to move from what is comfortable and familiar, but be willing to trust instead in your sometimes unsettling wisdom, but also your steadfast love. We thank you for the words of encouragement we have heard today. We're grateful for the work of our transition team in choosing a pastor for the next leg of our journey. So bless us now as we wait, pausing to renew and refresh ourselves for what lies ahead so that we might once again declare your praise through our life and ministry together. We rejoice today with the good things of life, of springtime as the earth renews itself with life, reminding us that life is indeed growth and change and can be beautiful. And hear our prayers today for all who are in need of healing and strength in your deep peace, those who are sick, those who near the end of mortal life. Comfort those who mourn, Encourage all who live in danger and empower us to works of ministry that can ease the suffering of this world. And as the season of Lent draws near its end, we give you praise. That Jesus came among us to reconcile us to you and to one another. We are gratefully amazed that his love and faithfulness allowed him to endure the cross knowing that unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will not bear fruit. May we be people who bear fruits of love and justice, bound together in Christ's name. And now let us pray together as Jesus taught his disciples, as we say, our Creator, whom in heaven. 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And today, for our moment for mission, I'm going to call upon Jan McCoy. Good morning. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn your bulletin to the front page because there was something about this beautiful photograph on here that really helped me focus. I don't really like talking um, publicly, so I was looking for ways to sort of concentrate my energies in a positive way, and this picture helped me do it. I'm here to tell you this morning about Eco Justice Ministries. It's a small nonprofit based here in Denver, and in fact, it's so small that it has only one employee, and that's the Reverend Peter Sautel. I work on the board of directors for the Ecojustice Ministries, um, and before I describe Peter's work, I'd like to share a story uh, that happened to me this week. As I was sitting down to write this, I had just read an article in the paper about a whale that had washed up on an Italian beach, and she was dead. She was overcome by 40 pounds of plastic waste in her stomach. Um, and this whale was pregnant, and the fetus died too. She was the fifth whale in the last six months to die from a big, giant wad of plastic waste, um, because whales can't digest plastic. Um, and I find this heartbreaking, and I imagine most of you do too. And there's probably an environmental issue that touches you very personally. Um, the demise of, of polar bears or pollinators, the, the just the, there's so many concerns that we have about the world we live in. And actually there was, climate change feels like an existential challenge and I think this can lead to despair. And actually another little point happened in uh, today's worship. This line from the first hymn we sang um, brought my my, my heart to mind here. O oh God, how, have we, how we have wandered and hidden from your face in foolishness have squandered your legacy of grace. So the very life of, web of life feels threatened and the problems we face are complex. Uh, and this can lead, I think, to feelings of despair. But our faith and the Bible tell us that despair and inaction are not enough. For 25 years, Peter Sattel has been framing ecology and social justice from the perspective of our Christian faith. One example is his weekly eco-justice notes. Each week, he writes thoughtfully about an issue like whales or a line of scripture to help clergy and lay people around the world, around the world, see our environmental and social justice challenges in new ways. Peter also works directly with congregations through a new initiative called Green Churches for the 2020s. Back in the 1990s, when we became a whole earth church, um, creating a church recycling program was a really positive step. But today, we face far bigger challenges, and in Green Churches for the 2020s, Peter is helping churches ask their own questions, like, could we become a zero carbons emission church? And if we were to do that, how would we begin to approach that? I mean, these are big picture questions, much more, with much more of an impact and much more necessary today than simply recycling our paper and plastic. Uh, the work that Peter does at the state legislature and with other environmental activists is on behalf of us, progressive Christians. He was asked to be the lead voice for the faith community in a landmark lawsuit that we learned about here at church uh, last year, a landmark lawsuit um, called Juliana versus the United States. The plaintiffs in this lawsuit are 21 young American youth, uh, uh, 
And they are, the lawsuit challenges the United States government on the issue of climate change and what it means for their future. So in our churches, we often ask, what kind of world do we want to live our children, leave our children and our grandchildren? Um, but this lawsuit and Peter's involvement in it have reframed the question a little bit for us. And this is the question now, I believe. What kind of world do our children and our grandchildren have the right to expect from us? That's a much tougher question, and I thank you as you ponder that question in this moment of mission. Thank you. As we prepare to receive our offering, I invite you to join with me in the prayer of dedication for the gifts that we are about to share. Our God, we present these offerings that they may be used to extend your liberating reign. With them, we offer our varied ministries in the days ahead, that each of us may be part of your answer to the cries of the world. Amen.
those who came seeking the holy, may the holy go with you and in you. To those of you who came seeking to embrace life, may life return your affection. To those of you who came seeking a better way, may you find that way and the courage and the patience to take it step by step. To those who came seeking a better world, may you make it so with your loving heart and hands. May it be so. Go in peace.